Thank you for joining for this uh, prostate cancer session on the FRCS urology preparation. Thank you for the trainee who has agreed to record the session. We will discuss the next clinical scenario. We are continuing with a patient who is quite fit with performance status zero. His PSA slowly climbed up. He was initially kept on active surveillance and uh, his PSA, for example, now it is 7.1. His prostate volume is uh, 90 and his uh, PSA density is 0 0.19. He had prostate biopsy which showed Gleason 4 plus 4 equal to 8 in at least 4 cores on the left side and 3 cores on the right side. And you are discussing the options of surgery and radiotherapy with him and he is leaning towards more radiotherapy. And uh, from the scoring system also you are quite happy to give him radiotherapy because he is leaning towards the high risk patient. How will you counsel radical radiotherapy for his prostate cancer? So um, I'd... Uh... I, I, I would want to really make this uh, this counselling session a joint session with the oncologists. Um, so I'd want to sort of have an MDT clinic um, where they can discuss the, the, these approaches. And we'd probably focus more on the surgical and they'd focus more on the on oncology. Um, if I'm talking about it, I would um, I'd probably first uh, ask the uh, status of their urinary symptoms and get an IPSS score. Because um, I think that'd be really helpful uh, in counseling them about whether they might need a TURP first. Um, ultimately, I'd then talk about what radiotherapy would involve. Um, they're in the, um, the high risk group um, of prostate cancer. Um, so they would have adjuvant radiotherapy um, six months beforehand and then likely up to three years um, after that. Uh, so for, for um, hormone, adjuvant hormone therapy. Um, so I'd explain what that involves, what the, what the side effects of hormones are and what the risks. Um, and then I talk about the radiotherapy itself. Um, so nowadays we, we tend to use a hypofractionated protocol. Uh, we know that that's, the, that's not inferior according to the CHIP trial. Um, and so um, that, that normally involves about uh, 20 fractions um, uh, to give 60 grays in total. So we're talking a Monday to Friday for four weeks or so. Um, they would come in. Um, they'd start off normally with a planning um, scan, um, and then they'd come in for their radiotherapy. Um, in terms of what the actual uh, radiotherapy involves, I'd say that they would normally need to keep a uh, full bladder um, prior to the scan, um, and obviously, you know, we we take their urinary symptoms into account. Um, and I would explain what the risks are, and so I I divide them into the risks involving the urinary symptom first um, so I talk about radiation cystitis about storage uh, urinary symptoms about um, uh, urinary incontinence um, particularly um, and I talk about urethral strictures um, and I then talk about um, toxicity to adjacent viscera um, so the way when we rectal toxicity um, so radiation proctitis um, and uh, PR bleeding. Um, and lastly, uh, I, I, well, thirdly, I talk about uh, sexual function, so the risk of erectile dysfunction. And lastly, I talk about the oncological issues, um, so the risk of recurrence in the future of his prostate cancer, but also the risk of secondary malignancy um, for one in 300 or so. Why do you want to have the bladder in little, relatively full? Um, I believe it helps in, in terms of... Um, uh, pushing away other viscera um, so that you, to minimize toxicity. Mainly pushing the bubble away. Okay. Okay. So, what is the role for neoadjuvant hormone treatment for radical radiotherapy patient? Um, so we know from the the radicals trial that it it confers a survival um, benefit. Um, so that, that that was a trial um, looking at um, external beam radiotherapy with or without hormones for three years um, in well up to T four prostate cancer. Um, and and yeah, as I say, they they found um, a um, disease free survival benefit um, of uh, from forty percent to seventy odd percent. Um, in the in the uh, hormone groups, so that's the evidence we use. Okay, um, is it radical trial? What about the BOLA trial and EORTC Sorry. trial? Sorry, I got completely confused. Yeah, not the radicals trial. Um, I'm talking about the, so the EORTC trial by BOLA et al. Um, yeah, sorry, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and you can uh, divide the patients into intermediate and high risk group. Is there any difference in the hormone regimen for the both groups? 
Yeah, so uh, it's not needed for, for low risk, but for intermediate risk, you just give a six month um, lot and then for the high risk, you give uh, up to three years. Okay. What about brachytherapy? Not for this patient, but what is the principle behind brachytherapy? Um, so the principle is that it's again radiotherapy, um, but it's uh, it's given directly into the prostate to minimize toxicity to adjacent viscera. Um, it can be done with a low dose or a high risk um, protocol. Um, and the, the broad principle is with the low dose, you're, you're putting permanent pellets in, um, that, for example, using iodine. One two five. Um, whereas with the um, high dose, you, you're te- you're, there's, there's no permanent pellets. You're just um, inserting uh, rods into the prostate, um, and um, you're not leaving any permanent implants in there. Um, for example, they might use iridium one nine two. And in terms of what I mean, for so the patient, the toxicity profile is going to be a little bit more prolonged with the low risk group. Um, talking sort of weeks to months. Um, uh, versus versus um, more sort of days with the um, high risk, uh, sorry, high dose um, brachytherapy group. Um, and you'd have to give patients appropriate counseling about um, protecting their family and, and sexual intercourse with the low dose group. Um, in terms of who that would be appropriate for, um, I'd normally counsel for anybody that's having, uh, that's got high risk disease, like this gentleman, for example, they would need to have it as part of a boost regime with external beam radiotherapy but it potentially be given as a monotherapy for lower risk groups okay what do you mean by psa bounce um it means the psa goes up after having radiotherapy which is not related to biochemical progression it normally peaks at about nine months or so um it shouldn't really go higher than 1.5 so is it uh, happens with external beam radiotherapy or low dose or high dose brachytherapy which group of patients get this um with external beam radiotherapy um i'm not sure actually if it happens with brachytherapy okay, it can happen with brachytherapy also up to 30 percent okay 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 so in a patient who had previous radical prostatectomy what is the role of post-surgery radiotherapy in which situations you need to consider um so the, the, i mean the short answer is in this country there is no role um, for adjuvant radiotherapy. Um, the the European guidelines are a little bit different. Um, so that that was the radicals trial. Sorry. So that, that that was the radicals trial looking at adjuvant versus salvage radiotherapy, and there was no real difference in survival between either of the groups. But there was certainly an increase in toxicity in the adjuvant group in terms of um, urethral strictures um, and sort of local complications. Um, but what it, it, the, Europe, the European guidelines do advocate it in select patients. So in patients that have, uh, well, the, the risk groups that identified were ones that have positive margins or have nodal disease or have T3 and above disease. If there's two out of three of those, then the EAU guidelines would advocate the use of adjuvant radiotherapy. But um, the, the NICE guidance um, don't think that there's a place for it. Uh, we would simply use salvage therapy um, if there's a biochemical recurrence. Yes, it's mainly it's because of uh, high incidence of the side effects like um, urinary incontinence, etc. The surgeons are not happy to have the adjuvant radiotherapy. They are quite happy to wait and do salvage radiotherapy if the patient progresses later. Okay. Okay. Your patient had uneven full robotic assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy. What is your follow up? I'd seen them at six weeks normally, um, and at that point, um, I would uh, see them with the CNS. I'd explain their histology, including their margin status. Um, I'd assess their symptoms, um, particularly their continence um, and their erectile function, um, and I'd also assess for any potential early complications. Hopefully, uh, you know, uh, uh, make sure the cat has come out without any hitch, etc. Um, and um, I would then want to put them on PSA monitoring. Um, so for the first um, year, I'd want them, uh, or a couple of years actually, I'd want them to be seen every three months with a PSA. Um, and um, I, yeah, I, I'd want it to be undetectable at three months. Um, and um, if there's any rise, then I would arrange appropriate invest- investigations. When, is, when you call the patient at biochemical recurrence for post-radical prostatectomy, so repeat that, uh, Mr. Dan Sheckton, sorry. When will you say a patient got biochemical recurrence in a patient who had post-radical prostatectomy? Okay, so yeah, so if it rises by um, 
to more than 0.2 in two two consecutive readings um, that are above that, then that would be a biochemical recurrence. Okay, what is your uh, strategy if it happens? Um, so I would want to assess their PSA velocity, but um, ultimately I'd discuss them in the NDT. Um, at some point, I uh, we we may consider doing imaging um, for them to assess for um, distant metastases, um, and if there aren't, then they might be a candidate for local salvage therapy in the form of radiotherapy, um, as we talked about. Um, the um, EAU guidance um, would would say that we should wait uh, for, for if we're doing a PSMA scan um, for their PSA to get to 0.5. Um, if there's no availability of that, then for a choline PET. Um, we probably wait until their PSA is above one. Um, but um, that's if we want to make sure that there's no distant metastases. Um, but ultimately, um, if we suspect local recurrence, um, uh, we don't have to see it on a, on a scan necessarily to offer them salvage therapy. Okay, how this PSMA PET scan works? Um, so prostate-specific membrane antigen um, is a, a transmembrane glycoprotein which is more highly expressed in, in prostate cancer cells um, and particularly uh, ones which are castrate resistant um, and um, it's a it's a form of PET scanning so positron emission tomography um, and so uh, the uh, injection that we give the patients involves a ligand for PSMA um, which binds to those tissues um, and then uses the the concepts used in PET scans that you know in terms of um, positron emission and annihilation of electrons to submit photons um, that's detected by our PET scan, and we can use a CT scan to then get structural information um, to correlate that uh, to our PET, PET imaging. Okay, good. I'm quite happy to stop it now. Do you have any questions in this scenario before we stop? Um, no, not uh, not really. Okay. Um, no? Yeah, good discussion. Very good. Cool. <laughs> it's time.